Get the cup, thank you. Well, um, thank you for inviting me to present the paper. So, um, again, more emerging markets, consistent with the theme of the conference. But this is a paper with Refet in the room. Um, Paul Luke, who is at Hong Kong Monetary Authority, so the usual disclaimer applies here. And Juhan Tian, who's with the Korea University Business School, currently visiting Bill Kent. Um, so I think um, this picture here that compares reserves to GDP ratio of uh, emerging markets and industrialized countries, they're quite, oh, you cannot hear at the back, okay. Can you hear me now? Okay, good. So this picture kind of makes it clear that emerging markets are quite different from more advanced economies. So when you think about this kind of reserve accumulation that's been going up rapidly in emerging markets, um, two broad themes in the literature um, have been something related to output concerns such as mercantilism, exports-led growth, and precautionary savings driven by things like sudden stops and other types of crisis. Um, so in this paper, we try to look into these two different, we focus on these two different possible motives and try to separate out what is what. Um, That's what the paper is. Um, so we studied 24 countries, emerging market countries, based on a small open economy, the SG model. Uh, when they, we're, we're going to show that both motives actually matter. There are some variations across countries. In some countries, one matters more than the other, but nonetheless, both matter. And the other important thing out of this paper will be that it's really important to model debt reserves and interest rates jointly. If you don't, you miss an important picture here. So the outline here is I'm going to first provide some motivations um, for the, the key features that I'm going to include in the model. Uh, mercantilism type mechanism and self-insurance type mechanism. Then I'm going to propose a really simple model that captures both and that allows us to analyze um, these mo motivations jointly. Um, so you can think of what we're doing. It's a really simple model. We, we, what, what we try to do is, okay, let's trip down the model as, let's make it as slim as possible. And see how far we can go with that really simple model. So that's what we try to do. Um, and we can think of this as a bridge towards more um, fully micro-founded models in the future. And finally, we conduct various quantitative analysis, killing one channel, killing the other channel type thing. There's not going to be enough time for this today, but I'll talk about some of that briefly um, um, towards the end of the presentation. So um, there's a sizable literature here. Uh, Laura has a paper up here. Javier has a paper up there. Um, and this has turned into really a significant literature. Um, some papers empirically and also with a very simple model analyzed both motives um, jointly. So ours is uh, more quantitative than these models that people have seen so far. And this will allow us to separate different channels um, more clearly. So that's the contribution. Um, so before I go and build in different features into the model, I first wanted to um, provide evidence that these motives actually exist in the data. So the question here, starting with the precautionary motives is, is it an increase in perceived sudden stop risk that has led to significantly higher levels of international reserves in emerging markets? Uh, this question is actually quite difficult to uh, answer because we first need to identify an event that is clearly associated with um, revision in the risk assessment. Um, quite often, um, for a lot of our sample countries, those events happen before our sample period, where the good data start. Um, partly, some countries have had a lot of crises in the past. If you go back 100 years, they're having crises. So it's really hard to spot the clear event based on which we can identify this. So what we do is we focus on the Asian financial crisis countries. Yes. So actually, if you look at um, recent picture, it's slightly going up actually as well, but it's not as much, obviously. Switz of course, Switzerland. Yeah, Switzerland. Yeah, Switzerland. Yes. Yeah, yeah. 
So, 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 so in, 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 that's the one sticker there that changes the pattern. What have I done? I have done something. Sorry about that. Um, so, so that's that's going to be in 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 there. That's going to be actually in there. Um, so maybe I can carry on. If it's not clear, we can go back to it. Okay. So, um, so I think. I mean, I'm from Korea, so I lived through this. Um, this is actually, I think, a very nice event because prior to 1997. These countries didn't have a major crisis, so in their memories, it's like the first big crisis. Um, Thailand and Indonesia had some others, but they were very small, minor crisis compared to the Asian financial crisis. So we're going to um, fo focus on these Asian financial crisis countries and see what happened to international reserves. So to this end, we use the synthetic control method. So what we do is uh, we take control group countries that did not go through the crisis. We, um, look for optimal weighted average of these um, con control countries. They can mimic um, the characteristics of um, Asian financial crisis countries prior to the Asian financial crisis. So that's what we're doing here. Um, so blue here is the actual. Red is synthetic or counterfactual without the crisis. And what we see here very clearly is that after 1997, the reserve, this is reserve to GDP. The reserve accumulation started taking off. So that should have been a significant event there. So this, uh, yes. Oh, we didn't include Malaysia here because we couldn't fit Malaysia very well. So we did it this country by country. Our control group countries are emerging market countries um, that did not go through the Asian financial crisis directly. So if, if you look at the paper, we actually list down what these countries are. Uh, so, so I, I'll talk about, I think I, I know where you're going with that question. So you might be wondering, okay, but they may not have had a crisis, for instance, but they might have observed what's happening in other countries. So if that's, that's what you're worried about, you can think of it as a lower bound estimate because that's the right kind of bias, right? That will lower the difference between blue and the red that gives you the treatment, treatment effect. So if there were countries out, out there that didn't experience the crisis directly, but nonetheless observed and learned, then that's going to be a lower bound estimate here. And nonetheless, that's quite significant. Is that, what is it? It's, so it could be the indirect effect. I mean, there's also the, mm -hmm. I learned from you, mm -hmm. but there's also the fact that there was the Russian crisis, the Brazil, mm -hmm. the, the thing that started to happen in 97, 98, 99. Yeah, so, so when we later do the structural estimation, we start after that sample period for these countries because they might have learned something May or might have changed the behavior. So yes, we start later for these countries. Ah, okay, I'm, ah, okay, you're talking about the weight. Okay, you're talking about, so, you, so I would have like a Japan there, uh, but you can take out Japan because you might say Japan had a, so we did robustness test taking out, out other countries. We can still get something quite similar. So what picture you see here is quite robust, I can tell you that. So we did one, leave one out estimation as well. And the results are not affected by that. Okay, so I, I know why you're worried about it. I understand. So we did it actually. So, um, so one thing to take away from this is that it is this event that led to the persistent increase in reserve accumulation. So that we did a bit more than this. What we did was we actually looked at for Korea. We looked at newspaper articles with the keywords mentioning things related to international reserves, and you see structural change in the amount of coverage after the financial crisis in 97. So we, we provide quite a bit of evidence here and there. Um, for output externality, so we are using this terminology. It's a catch-all term for the lack of better term. So it's going to be capturing things like, um, you know, it, it could be um, trade export-led growth. It could be other things. We just, it's a catch-all here. Um, this is reduced from evidence, uh, weaker than what we have for the precautionary one. Nonetheless, we see a positively and statistically significant relationship between per capita GDP growth and change in reserve accumulation. Um, so this is pretty much in the style of Benigno and Fornado. Um, so this is consistent with observation that the faster growing countries are net exporters of a public capital. Okay, 
So um, when you extend this to cover, let's say, up until 2020, you still see more or less the same pattern. Um, so um, this is the model. Um, so here, the yeah, yeah, we're gonna fit it into the model. We're gonna, we're gonna, I'm gonna show you in the next few slides. Um, so it's just two slides down the road. Okay, so, um, so, um, so in modeling this, we are gonna put in these features into the model and we're going to recognize that during normal times, um, the potential crises are actually internalized and in formulating the policy. Second is the crisis, they happen abruptly in emerging markets. So here, delta is going to be the regime indicator. Zero means a normal time. One means a crisis. It's, it's an exogenous regime change uh, driven by this Markov chain. Um, and we're going to model the sudden stop episode as, as one where output is reduced. And the borrowing from the international capital market um, is hampered. So if you restrict the model so that you're all, always all in the normal regime, then you are back to the standard DSG model. This is a regime switching um, DSG model. So the output will model it as a sum of, I'm, I'm now going to address your question. Um, it's going to be sum of some stochastic process. Plus this bit here, that's going to be modeling output externalities coming out of reserves. Um, so this thing, um, what we're going to do is, we're going to microfound other bits in the model. Here we'll use something that works well empirically. So I'm gonna be very specific in the next few slides. Um, so the important thing from here is that total output here, um, the, 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 the total output here, which is driven by, partly by output externalities, that's present during normal times, but they disappear during a crisis. This is consistent with the trend Taylor type model. Um, and we're going to consider quite a bit of different functional forms and to see which functional forms work best in some countries and some others. That's what we're going to look at. Um, this is the premium process for the real interest rate. So you can see, um, so Shimikura and Yuribe, they actually have only um, that here inside. So we expand this premium process to have reserves additionally and their interaction which becomes useful during a crisis. Um, so this is empirically grounded. So if you look at papers of Sebastian Edwards or Inji Gimush, you see that uh, all of these reserves and um, that are very highly statistically significant determinants of the premium. Um, we do a bit more than that, so we actually microfound this. So if you look at the appendix of the paper, we actually modeled uh, lenders in international capital markets, solved the lenders problem, actually obtained this functional form. In fact, we actually obtained something more general so you can actually, for instance, if you have a shock term here additionally, we can capture that as well. Um, the important parameter here will be this phi zero. If it goes to zero, that means financial friction disappears. So we're going to empirically estimate what this is as well as what these other parameters are. Um, all right. Um, and we actually did quite a bit on the determinacy properties uh, coming out of this premium process. So what we show in the appendix of the paper is that what matters is the relative sizes of the coefficient for um, debt and coefficient for reserves. And depending on how their values are, the co-movement between debt and reserves will be determined. And when you take the derivative of this, so let's say first derivative with respect to debt is positive, second derivative is positive. So if you accumulate too much debt, your premium goes up too fast, you don't want that. If you take the second derivative, uh, first derivative with respect to reserves, that's positive. Second is negative, so I mean, negative and positive. So accumulating reserves that helps, but it has a limit. So that kind of thing is built into this kind of premium function. And the sudden stop here enters, as I said earlier, the model through the third term here, which is interacted with the, the regime indicator. So this is triggered upon entering crisis, and we need a simulation. Most of the time, this is positive. That means your interest rate will be spiking when the crisis comes. And that's consistent with the um, empirically documented fact that interest rates are counter-cyclical. Yes? Are you worried about determinacy? Uh, here? I mean, would mm -hmm. you be more worried about equal to extremes? I, I, I mm -hmm. know extremes are because they give higher output. Yeah, but I mean, like, then model, you cannot close the model if model is indeterminate, right? But you already have that, that, that function there. No? I see, because you're going to do linear. 
Yeah, yeah, we're, we're, yeah, yeah. So, so um, we actually do a very careful analysis in the appendix of the paper, talking about determinants, region, and etc. So, if you look at the math, there, it's going to come out very clearly why we worry about these issues. And, and are we thinking both fixed and flexible, or it depends on different parameters we give you? What, what is fixed and like a fixed exchange rate? Ah, we're not modeling the exchange rate here explicitly. So, the idea is less. Yeah, but when we think about the mm -hmm. model, does it apply? To either or both, depending on the parameters, or just more too flexible, or more too fixed, or what? Um, I'll talk a little bit about that um, as I go along, and I don't think I can give you a complete answer on that. But maybe you can. We can come back to that, and you can ask, push me further to to answer your question. Yeah, I know that the pi, one of those pi is positive. Then, then you shouldn't have uh, this behavior. Is that what you're worried about? Um, so. When these things are too close, when phi, so what matters, we show that uh, what matters for the determinants is not just the values of phi d and phi s, but the difference between the two matters too. So you cannot have them too far away, you can have them too close. We actually show it in the paper. Okay. Uh, I, I think seeing the math, I mean, I, I tried to put the math out of the presentation, but that's in the paper. Yes? Identify. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I, actually, I, I think we, I know where you're going with this. So, if what matters is net reserves only, when we actually estimate the model, the parameters there will be the negative of the other, right? So, by using this specification, we can actually ask, okay, is it only the net that matters or is the gross that matters? If the gross that matters, they will show up as different parameters. So, so, so empirically estimating this model will tell us whether it's the net reserves that matters or gross reserves that matter. And I think if the net reserves are what, what, what matters, the value of phi d and phi s will be very close to one another. If not, it'll show up empirically. So I think that's probably the question you had in mind. Have, have, am I correct? Okay, good, thank you. <laughs> sorry, I mean, I cannot really hear very well, so I'm sorry about that. Okay, um, so just, to, just a reminder. So here, crisis is exogenous, right? It's driven by um, Markov chain. But it's important to remember that the impact of a crisis depends on the what kind of debt reserve portfolio is selected. So the impact is endogenous, okay? All right. Okay, so this is standard incomplete asset market, bonds only. We're using simple CRRA utility function. In the appendix, you'll see we considered other utility functions too, such as Epstein Zinn. Doesn't really change the result much. That's where we're sticking to something simple here. Um, the, this is a standard uh, budget constraint. What's interesting here is that trade balance in this model is the difference between this total output and consumption, and that includes externalities here, output externalities, VT. So you, can, you may think of this as a trade externalities, if you'd like. Okay, we're not pushing that interpretation, but you can think of it that way. Um, so this is the summary of the model. This is, mo uh, so we have a debt and reserve elastic interest rate. That's why the first order conditions are quite complicated. But it, it comes out very clearly that the portfolio of debt and reserves really matters in this model, okay? Otherwise, the model is quite simple. And this is like a model version 20 something. So we have tried all kinds of different models. And we're quite confident, okay, this is the simplest model that we can work with that would go as far as we want, okay? So I'm gonna talk about VT now, functional form of the VT now. Is that what you are asking? Yeah, what is the Okay, so, so I'll show you now, okay. So these are the forms we have considered. So we have 24 countries. We actually have considered more functional forms than this. We estimated 100 something models in total, 24 countries. So we're, we actually, in the paper we go through um, four of this. Um, so um, these, these are quite flexible. We actually plot what they look like. They're flexible. They cover many plausible shapes of the externalities. They subsume some of the standard forms. For instance, if you set this to one, that's linear model. People have used I have used it in another paper. And later, I'll talk about the results, but when the results come out, I mean, I recently read Laura's paper that talks about, okay, the real exchange rate depreciation, its impact really depends on import dependence of um, 
these countries. And of course, if you are doing real exchange rate uh, manipulation through a reserve accumulation, it's kind of made sense to us that why some country, for some countries, certain shapes work better than the other. We capture that heterogeneity in the, uh, in the paper. So I, after reading the paper, I thought, okay, this makes a lot of sense to me. That's what I thought. Um, all right, um, what did you say? Thanks. Okay. <laughs> uh, so, of course, we love Javier's paper. So we thought that when we were doing the simulation, okay, you know, we should do as well as Javier does, right? So the first column here is the Mexican data that he calibrated his, his model against. It's Javier's AR paper that we liked very much. So we tried to see, can we do at least as well as um, he and his co-authors do? The answer is, yeah, we seem to be doing pretty okay. Cop Douglas is not as well as the rest, but you, know, you can see we're pretty close to this Mexican data in terms of, so what we're going to do now is that, okay, um, we were very happy. We could do at least as well as uh, he did. So let's take this model, try to match more moment. Let's try to do other quantitative exercises. So to us that this was like a sanity check. So this is not completely insane. Um, so we're trying to estimate this model. We're estimating this model. And um, if you use standard projection method, it takes forever, right? So we had to find a good trade-off between speed and accuracy. So here, we're using Levintel's uh, Taylor projection method, which is hybrid between the two. It gives us speed that we need. It gives us the accuracy that we wouldn't feel uncomfortable with. Um, tw again, 24 countries, about 50 years of annual data. And for the Asian financial crisis countries, we are using only the post-break data because we just documented earlier the behavior of the reserve accumulation changed as a result of the risk discovery. Um, here, to estimate the regime probabilities, I'm talking about the, 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 the Markov chain I, I showed earlier. Since we assume crisis is exogenous, we estimated using Leibniz and Valencia's coding of crisis here. So for the default crisis, uh, the sovereign default, we are thinking of debt, restru debt restructuring as the end of um, of the crisis that's consistent with the standard practice. So 11 moments, target moments, using simulated method of moments. So we're gonna look at means and standard deviations of debt to GDP, reserve to GDP, trade balance to GDP, and interest rate spread and other moments related to this variable. So those are 11 moments in total. Um, so we have a very detailed analysis in the paper, and I cannot go through all of them. So today I'll just talk about the um, summary. Um, so let me just go back here. I think I forgot to mention this. All of these different specifications for our externalities, if this parameter phi s goes to zero, all of them disappear, okay? So we're going to estimate this parameter. So to see to what extent output externalities are important, okay? Um, so when we do, we can match the data without going crazy on the co coefficient the, the risk aversion coefficient as well as the discount factor, they're all within the standard range. Um, phi zero here, that's the one that governs financial friction. If that goes to zero, premium goes to zero. It's sufficiently large for, larger than zero for all countries indicating this financial friction there. Except for one country, that's South Africa. This might change when you extend the data. So phi s, this is the coefficient in the premium function for reserves is greater than FIDI, which is the coefficient for um, debt, which indicate, which is consistent with what people have found with the, in, in regression-based studies. And finally, FIDS, this is the coefficient in front of a term, uh, which turns on when you enter the crisis in the premium function that is greater than zero for all countries. That means crisis does something um, that is separate from the normal times. And finally, except for four countries, phi s is greater than zero, meaning there's output externalities. So that's the evidence related to reserve accumulation. Um, and then what we do is we simulate the model and see what comes out of the model. Um, and I think a lot of people have commented on this issue, but really data in emerging markets are really heterogeneous. Um, and our simple model, again, really simple model, right? It captures quite a bit of means and standard deviations of debt to GDP, reserves to GDP, and interest rate premium. They do pretty well, given its simplicity. It matches the sign of the correlation between 
that the GDP and uh, reserve to GDP pretty well in almost all countries. In fact, if we use not the best fitting function for output externalities, we can match in all of the countries. This is something that Javier has shown that is an important thing to think about in his recent paper. Um, and this, for Korea and Thailand, um, we, we underpredict the reserve accumulation. That's not surprising. Why? Because they had one crisis, the short-lived, relative to other countries. So if you do estimation the way we do, you're supposed to understate. Um, so what we have done is, okay, if you increase the persistence, so what we're saying is, what's coming out of the maximum likelihood may not be what's perceived by these countries. So if, if you increase crisis probabilities, then we can start to match what we see in the data in this country. In fact, I have done work related to this, to this with a Paul, who's also author in this paper. This is really, uh, what, how we did it was uh, using robust control with the 19 uncertainty, and we used asset data to try to come up with the, um, the measure of a model uncertainty. So increasing probabilities here to match the data and uh, reserve accumulation in the data that is consistent with the robust control type idea. Okay, so just wanted to point that out. Um, this, I'm in South Africa, so I just wanted to show you that we can do pretty well with the South Africa. Um, with the new data, um, we'll see how well we do. We're gonna extend the data as we go along. Um, so one quantitative exercise, I'm, I'm almost done. Um, so we're asking ourselves, let's turn off these mechanisms and see which one is important for each country in our sample. So for, for instance, with Argentina, what we show is that when you turn off output externalities by setting phi s to zero, pretty much nothing changes. But when you turn off regime switching, this is the sudden stop, you will see debt to GDP and reserve to GDP increasing substantially. Um, so for Argentina, we say precautionary motive matters more than output externalities. And I think in your paper, you talk about, you, you, you tell us difference between uh, Latin America and Asian countries. But in, Okay, so Argentina is not there, okay. No, it's just too Okay, cool. okay, fine. <laughs> All right. So but we actually do it with other countries too. So if you look at the paper, we carefully study other countries as well. Um, so um, probably I picked the wrong example here. <laughs> So in general, what we show is that um, the effect of the output externalities, we decompose it into substitution effect and income effect. And in different countries, because the best fitting output externalities function would be different, and they induce different income and substitution effects out of reserve accumulation. So we relate that, and probably that's why when you have, uh, so Eisenman and Lee, for instance, what they showed is, okay, Let's try to explain reserve dynamics with uh, mercantilism-related variables. So what they find is economically these are not very significant. <coughs> Probably it's because of what's going on here. There's quite a bit of heterogeneity uh, underneath. So um, I guess I can so conclude. The, the so for each country, yeah. we pick the best fitting premium function. Okay. And those things, because they, they're, they're shaped very differently they induce different income and substitution effects. But in general, that would externality is also higher reserve? No, 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 it depends. Not necessarily. Not necessarily. So that's what I'm trying to understand. Yeah. Because so in, the problem that you set up by the government, I mm -hmm. So, so in some countries, um, so, output externalities are so strong, they don't need to accumulate so much. In some others, it's pretty weak, so they have to accumulate a lot. So we empirically actually characterize that. So that's why we do these quantitative exercises. That's, we are breaking it down by doing these quantitative exercises. So we actually talk about both gross and net. So that's in the paper. Yeah. So I, I, mean, I, I think I know where it's coming. Yeah, that's, that's something really, we are very excited to. Yeah, so. So, 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 so towards the end of the paper, we really carefully study a few countries that are very representative of emerging markets. Uh, so that might be. So what we show is that, well, different countries have different reasons for holding international reserves. And we argue that um, to get complete understanding, you need to model reserves, debt, and interest rate jointly. So that's what the paper is about. Well, thank you.
What's going on? What? Yes, should I? No, it's on, it's on. It's on? You can't hear me? <laughs> this is terrible. <laughs> this is on full screen mode? No? Okay. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, uh, thank you very much for having me here, first of all. It's great to be here. Uh, and it's great to be discussing this paper by uh, two colleagues and friends. That's why I kind of titled this discussion, How Many Bridges One Can Burn in 10 Minutes? Uh, let's see. Uh, the answer is at least two, because both Refet and Sung uh, are colleagues from, colleagues from Bilkent, and they are dear friends. But two is also a good number, or the, the number, for the number of hypotheses that people put out in terms of reserve accumulation. Why emerging markets accumulate reserves? I believe I'm the wrong person for this question because even though I'm, I've been living in Malaysia for the past four years, my background is all the way, you know, for the past 25 years is from New Zealand, where let the exchange rate depreciate, it would do everything for you kind of thing was in my DNA, if you like. Maybe it still is, but I will give my best shot uh, about uh, so giving my two cents about certain aspects of the paper, but obviously in 10 minutes I can't cover uh, everything. So the first hypothesis is mercantilism. That's a, you know, the export-led growth, that real exchange rate undervaluation that the countries can achieve through accumulation of foreign reserves. That's a, you know, a, in the language of a Anton Koronek, in the presence of targeting problems or when policy choices are restricted by some, something else, the first best policies such as subsidies to capital accumulation or subsidies to tradable productions are not feasible. So this is one way of e e achieving that. Second one, you know, based on my four years in Malaysia, based on what I hear from the policymakers, especially my kind of my cozy boss, the former governor of Bank of Ma e Central Bank in Malaysia, who was at the forefront of introducing these models these policies, capital controls, and so on. Whenever I speak to her, she always comes to this one, you know, build up buffers. We are building buffers, that's the thing. That is the main thing. The main thing she keeps uh, telling me about these things. Uh, this is one of the motivating slides or charts in this uh, literature that I find, you know, uh, I guess it's a correlation, it's, as Sun was saying, uh, but this paper is going to do more than that. I was writing my slides at a bar in Cape Town called Cause and Effect. Literally, this is the name of the bar. Beautiful brandy and so on. I thought, wow, uh, these guys are really taking this causal stuff very seriously, you know, as opposed to motivating the paper with that. The first thing out of three that they are doing, first, take this causal thing very seriously with synthetic control. Okay, it is one, and oh, sorry, take it seriously. Use synthetic control and take this to a structural model or a quasi-structural model, if I may say, because certain aspects of the model is not a, a micro-founded. So one small digression, you know. I mean, one thing I thought there might be something. There must be some instrument out there. One idea that came to my mind is a, some kind of a Bartik instrument. Uh, the second one is the variation in the date at which countries join WTO or countries open up their trade that changes or that gives an exogenous variation to the export of those countries that might uh, explain something. But that's something else. Uh, there was a question about Malaysia here. I kind of wonder, uh, Malaysia, I mean, if you think in terms of what's the definition of sudden stop, some people use, you know, this 5% fall in uh, 
net inflows -y kind of stuff. Malaysia had that kind of experience in 1994, even though it was 5%, but the net flows, the fall was 5%, but the, still the numbers didn't go into negative territory, if you like. So before your 1997 period, something else was happening. It was not their first experience, if you like, son. I wonder if this is the reason why things are not working in Malaysia. Or maybe nothing works in Malaysia. Uh, I want to say a few things about synthetic control because I'm biased. I teach these kind of stuff. And in the language of Susan Athey and Hudio Imbens, this is arguably the most important innovation in policy evaluation literature in the last 15 years, and Sang is one of those people who is taking this to a number of uh, sort of macro questions. Uh, you know, I mean, the labor guys are big on this. Uh, Sang, uh, uh, thank you very much uh, for this. And in a nutshell, it builds on difference and differences, but it really provides much more systematic comparison. You know, if, if we sort of think in terms of David Card's famous male boat lifting, do I compare Miami with Houston, or Atlanta, or St. Petersburg, or all three of them, and average of them? Here, instead of choosing between those three cities, the synthetic control is going to choose weights for each of these cities, so the weight, weighted average is more similar to Miami than any single city. And the paper, sort of, in terms of their application, list those weights, okay? Uh, but then when we look at those weights, one question is, do these weights really make sense? You know, you have got some very irrelevant country, they are not neighbors, they are not trading. Somehow there is something similarity, some similarity going on between those two countries, but where does that come from? You know, for a structural model, I have no idea. This is not sort of anything, it's not something about your paper, but the technique itself, you know, what do those weights mean, especially when they come from some other part of the world, some, somewhere else? Here is one of my first comments. This is, some already showed this, this is from Indonesia. I might be making a stupid comment, making full of myself. This is over GDP as a percentage of GDP. If I compare these initial jumps in reserves over GDP, it is very similar to the fall in GDP at the beginning of the crisis. I mean, in the case of Indonesia, it was 18%. GDP fell 18% at this point in time. I'm wondering if that is just an artifact of the denominator. Uh, so it might be, uh, you know, one can sort of check the absolute dollar values of reserves, for example. And that number that I was citing, 18%, it is also similar to Korea's 8% and Thailand's 12% fall in GDP in that year, in the initial uh, sort of hit of the Asian financial crisis. Oh, by the way, God, I forgot, you know, you know how I said I can burn at least two bridges? There are three IMF guys, at least one former. Uh, <laughs> You come to my region, they don't call it Asian financial crisis, they call it IMF crisis. So, 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 same in Korea, I know, definitely. So, I might be burning five bridges today. Okay. Here's the thing, I mean, there was a question about, uh, one thing about synthetic control, more second generation estimates of
countries that build reserves, if you like, your traded countries, whether they benefited from that, I said, you know, my background is from New Zealand, let the currency go down the drain, that's gonna fix everything that we believe in. That is, in where I live now, in the region, they really do not appreciate currency depreciations. They are really, really worried about that one. And, uh, but we don't have the exchange rate in the model, whether it can tell us anything about that. Anyway, it is such a timely paper, I believe, especially when we are talking about IPF kind of discussions, you know, macroprudential capital flows and all these, and I enjoyed reading this. Thank you. We've done Malaysia and other, we've done Philippines, we've done Malaysia as well. The Philippines we can fit pretty well, but not as well as the countries I have shown. Malaysia is difficult, and I, honestly I don't know why it is so difficult, so I'll take up on your comment and try to learn what's going on. Um, and when it comes to using synthetic control in general, this is just not criticism of what we do, but for the methodology in general, when you get uh, control countries with a high weight, sometimes it's not clear why they are there. So I understand. That's why we did leave one out type estimates. Just making sure that the results are not driven by one country in particular. So we've done a lot of, ro we've, we've done a lot of robustness tests there. So even though you work with the different sample countries, we can still, so it doesn't exactly address the criticism of the methodology. Uh, but nonetheless, we can talk about the robustness of the results and these are robust. So finally, of course, exchange rate is extremely important. Refat and I, we've been writing papers on exchange rate, um, so I completely agree. It's just that the spirit of the exercise was let's, let's work with the simplest possible model. Which is not very simple, by the way. Yeah, but I mean, so we, as I said, this, we tried 20 different models. It's not, we're just presenting. We thought, okay, this is something simple enough and it goes far enough. Um, we just wanted to see what the core mechanism is. Uh, so we want to flesh that out first before we go add add uh, bells and whistles and see what things we can do additionally. Um, and, some, and there was a question on the exchange rate regime. So one thing we are thinking of doing additionally is sorting countries according to regimes and see how their parameters are different. So that might address some of your questions. But in the background, um, I, I mean, I was very much, when we added this output externalities mechanism into the model, we were inspired by this um, Benigno Fornaro paper that talks about real exchange rate depreciation related to reserve accumulation. So that thing is in the background, very much in the background, actually. So, it's, so we can definitely f flesh that out as we add other features into the model. But for now, we just wanted to show, okay, this is how far you can go quantitatively with this model that is simple. It's not super simple, but simple enough. So I think that addresses some of your comments. Yeah. But Refet might have something to add. If I may. Okay. So first, thank you. Um, one, one risk of having a discussion with a friend is you're going to get too friendly a discussion. Uh, <laughs> That's not the case. <laughs> Our friendship's over. <laughs> sudden stops. These are reduced form and empirical. And then a model that tries to make sense of this for a whole bunch of countries. So that model, for our taste, was, you know, having read the literature and inspired by it, you know, including people here, we're thinking, you know, what are the similarities and differences across countries? Is it that, you know, um, now that I understand Mexico, I understand emerging markets, or are they sufficiently different, right? But we, for me to make sense of things, they have to work in the same language, and that's why we need a model, okay? And it turns out, this model actually, with slightly different parameters, helps fit a whole bunch of countries that seem extremely disparate from each other, right? In general, you don't expect to be able to understand Korea and Argentina through the same mechanism. Here we do, and that's, that's the beauty. Okay. Um, the reduced form bit, you're welcome to criticize it. It's reduced form, and none of us are huge fans of that. Right? But it's useful to have some sense of the correlations that is in the data that might show up in the model. But it's the model that gives the causal interpretation. So I think that's fine in that regard. 
And um, just to add a little bit to that, when you were thinking about the resist from output externalities, I mean, externalities in general, when you go through the literature on anything, economics, it's not very clear how, how to quantify externalities. Of course, we have AK-type models that are very useful. But in general, there's no clear guidance on how to model externalities. That's why we ended up exploring different functional forms. At, at the risk of, uh, yeah, yeah, so, yeah. Why it's different across these countries? How it relates to exchange rates? But you know, you don't want to go for meaning of life papers, so I'm not going to answer all questions. Mm. This seems to set the stage better to understand. You know, in some countries, it seems to be more of a chick to stop or you know, deal with sudden stops. In some other countries, it's more of a chick to the output externalities, and hopefully, based on this. Somebody else, or maybe we will in future work, will think about how that relates to exchange rates, how that you know relates to country characteristics. Why is it that these countries are not all the same? These are great questions that can now be asked. You know, it's definitely interesting work, and it's a very challenging, you know, question, and you know, make some, some assumptions and, and some shortcuts. I wonder what is the precise market foundation you have for the um, for these output externalities. Why would it depend on reserves and not debts? You know, um, if I think about a country that is trying to keep, say, wages low, I real wages low, then you would think you're going to try to, um, you know, have more capital outflows, so you're going to have more reserves. But if you also slow down debt accumulation, you're also going to help to keep real wages low. But the way you specify the only Reserve, sure, sure. Not, not that. Um, so that's, and then, yeah, once you have the estimations for the countries, there's some pattern mm -hmm. there. So, so my, so our co-author, Ju, with the Paul Bergen and the Che of Chain Taylor, they are now working on the micro foundation of this kind of mechanism, and this is through capital flow. Um, so they're working yeah, on the kind of stuff. Again, it's more about yeah, more. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I. So I understand what, you're, what you said, and uh, sure, of course, we can always think about, even if you do this in reduced form, we can think about putting other variables there and see what they do. So you're, you're right there, I, I completely agree. But we just wanted, to, the idea is we wanted to keep the model as simple as possible. That's why we did it that way. And of course, you know, if we enrich the model that way, all these other variables, was, that would start to matter. I, I, I agree with what you said. Javaria, Very interesting paper. Back to the figure with the job in the ratio. Okay. So even more than the decline in GDP, which mm -hmm. of course no. is yeah. this is driven by the exchange rate. You have yeah. a massive exchange rate mm -hmm. shooting, which is why I worry sure. a bit about the absence of exchange rate okay. discussion there. Because you have massive exchange rate mm -hmm. shooting, mm -hmm. and so nominal GDP mm -hmm. in dollars crashes. Sure, in sure. Area. You also have, you have a recession plus yeah. that sure. as a ratio of reserves, and then reserves, reserves shoot up. So for the other countries, mm -hmm. uh, on average, you don't have massive depreciations mm -hmm. that where it's a bad for reserves. So it's much more normal. In addition to those two channels, then you have also uh, the fact that reserves are close and they include the bailout loans. So if you have a massive bailout package, you have reserves going up. So we can do this. It goes up uh, symmetrically. You can, you, can yeah, still, yeah. you know, you may get rid of that. And sure. So, so, so we can do the similar thing with reserves to debt, for instance, if you're uncomfortable yeah. with the output. And we can, we can match those as well. Yeah. No, I, I, yeah, was, I yeah, think this yeah. really... Yeah, of course it's important. That's, yeah. That's yeah. A, the second comment I had is, again, on these stylized facts, um, you showed that graph showing the positive correlation for the reserves accumulation and the GDP growth. And there, uh, the mechanism I would I, I, I have of first is actually the trade. So mm -hmm. you have a big improvement in commodities mm -hmm. terms of trade, countries run current mm -hmm. account surpluses, uh, central banks want to prevent excessive appreciation, mm -hmm. or more simply they have a bank, uh, take, take uh, the GI the countries in the Gulf. So you have massive reserve accumulation mm -hmm. going together with boom times in the end, and hence the correlation comes from there. So the reserves is ancillary to the 
story, the real story is the terms of trade. So, and, so, know, so one version, so we yeah, for yeah. That at least so, before showing those so one version of the model we considered had separated goods into tradables and non-tradables, and we did some of that. Uh, we presented this version in the end because it's the simplest. So you're completely right. That kind of mechanism is important. We just wanted to see, OK, let's just strip it down further. Can you still do it? Of course, you're right. And that's, that's an important thing to model. Model, okay. show as motivation okay. by variant graph mm -hmm. showing a correlation between mm -hmm. reserves and okay. conservative emission and I would want to see at least a, condition, a correlation of the conditions of the okay. Okay. Uh, Because then you're much more likely to capture the type of, you know, exchange, uh, the type of effects that you're interested in, okay. which is manipulating, you know, okay. which, the real exchange rate to drive up, okay. to drive okay. up okay. the next step. But, but sure, I, um, I completely um, agree that it's important thing to model. and. Um, It may not be the only real exchange rate type mechanism that's driving the reserve accumulation related to upward externalities, though. So um, at the end of the day, I think we still capture the total effects broadly OK. But when you go into decomposition, why this, what was driving what, this where your comment will be very useful. So thank you. Thank you for that. OK. I see, I see, I see. So I see, I see, yeah. Okay. So for the premium function bit, we have the micro foundation. So we, we do talk about, OK, what are the underlying parameters that lead to the shape? So for those, we can do some. But for output externalities, we're very clear this reduced form. So I think Rafet's comment is not very clear what to do with those. And as Javier said, I mean, there might be other variables that matter to our model, maybe too simple, capturing something important. So I think we broadly capture the total effect, but I think jean -Marie said, OK, the decomposition matters too. What's driving what? So in that sense, it may be difficult to do at this point. And I put, nonetheless, I think that's a very good exercise. We have to do, think more about what we are doing. Maybe we can do it if we improve the model along the way. So I don't know. <laughs> OK, fine. I mean. <laughs> Great. Thank you very much. Let's go for the tea of the day. Exactly. I was wondering if you tell you how.